To pay off the loans, they were forced to ignore laws that protected their environment, to lower wages, and to cut back on their education and on their health care. They were also forced to privatize and sell off their resources to crooked corporations like Enron. Lord Wakeham, the director of N.M. Rothschild and Sons, was on the audit committee of Enron and cooked the books and sucked billions from pension funds and investors before declaring bankruptcy. When poor nations were unable to pay their loans, they were given new loans to pay off the old loans. But these so-called bailout loans weren't about bailing out the poor. They were about bailing out and lining the pockets of loan underwriters like Citigroup and America's most notorious crooks and banksters. As desperately poor nations got more desperately poor, the filthy rich banksters got filthier rich, and God help anybody who got in their way. Davison Butto, senior economist for the International Monetary Fund, resigned to, quote, wash my hands of the blood of millions of poor and starving people. When President John F. Kennedy tried to take back America by reviving U.S. government printed money, his head was blown off in a Dallas motorcade. When his son planned to expose the ugly truth about his father's assassination, his small plane plunged into the ocean, killing all on board. In the 1950s, a weapon was invented that has become more powerful than America's deadliest weapons of mass destruction. It is the weapon of mass deception, and it is right in our own living rooms. The hypnotizing world of picture television brings us the news of the world through two central news agencies called Reuters and the Associated Press. The Rothschilds bought Reuters in the 1800s, which later bought the Associated Press and made the Rothschild family owners of the world's largest central news services. To the present day, the world depends on these Rothschild-owned central news services as their main source of news and information. In his book called Who Owns the TV Networks, author Eustace Mullins claims that the major TV networks, radio stations, newspapers, and publishing empires are controlled by the Rothschild, Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan money cartels through their corporate conglomerates. The bankster-owned media conglomerates include weapons manufacturers General Electric and Westinghouse, which profit from promoting wars. Their man in Washington is head of the FCC Federal Communications Commission, and his name is Michael Powell, the son of Colin Powell. Michael Powell was put in charge of changes to the media monopoly rules and who can own what. Joining public opposition to Michael Powell's FCC deregulation policies, Senator Byron Dorgan had this to say. Seldom have I seen a regulatory agency cave in so completely to the big economic interests. That's exactly what happened today with the FCC rules. And Chairman Powell kept suggesting slight modifications. It's not slight at all. These are, this is a big deal. It's going to affect what the American people can see, can hear, can read. And let me emphasize something that was in your setup piece. After what the FCC did today, it is likely, in fact, that in big American cities, we will see the same company own the newspaper, three television stations, eight radio stations, and the cable system in that city, all under one company. And I don't know what happened to this notion of competition, but I'm telling you, it's not there, and it's not embedded anywhere in the FCC's decision. Well, I'm just going to have to say that, that there are a lot of lies being told. In his new book, Brock says the key to the success of the right-wing media is opinion, predicated on a raft of distortions, misrepresentations, and outright lies presented to the readers and viewers as fact. I think it used to be... Control over the internet, publishing, recording, and top cable companies can be traced back to the same big five media empires, General Electric, Time Warner, Viacom, Disney, and News Corp. These media monopolies are owned directly or indirectly by the Rothschild, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, and Oppenheimer Brotherhood. Yes, there are now more stations and more media voices, but they're all coming from the same ventriloquist, says Senator Dorgan. Every 
TV show needs corporate sponsors, and corporate sponsors sponsor pro-business, pro-government programming, and journalists who support the agenda of the big five media owners. While two-thirds of the world goes hungry, these banksters offer gazillion dollar sponsorships to sports athletes to play with their balls. Why? Because they keep the masses distracted from the important issues, like the passage of the Patriot Act to limit your civil rights and freedoms. The Patriot Act allows the government to come into your home, take things from your home, search your home, and never tell you about it. Increasingly, however, Americans are speaking out. The media and banking monopolists now have the power to make or break political leaders around the globe. Why haven't the networks made a TV movie of the week about how the Bush family made their family fortune? The movie could be called The Awful Truth, starring George W.'s great-grandfather Samuel P. Bush, whose Buckeye Steel Castings Company supplies parts for Edward Harriman's railroads, who in turn provides rail shipments for John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, who in turn gets monopoly financing from the Rothschilds. The movie could be made into a TV series starring Samuel's son, Prescott Bush, as the managing director of a Nazi steel manufacturing plant in Poland called Silesian Consolidated Steel. In episode one, Prescott Bush forwards American financing to his German partner, Fritz Tyson through the Union Banking Corporation in New York. Fritz Tyson arranges a contract with Nazi Germany's IG Farben Company for free Jewish slave labor in Bush's steel manufacturing plant at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Episode two shows Skull and Bonesman Prescott Bush and Avril Harriman getting caught under Trading with the Enemy Act as the U.S. government moves in and seizes all of their shares in Union Banking Corporation. In episode three, Prescott's son, the first George Bush, is director of the CIA. George puts drug king Manuel Noriega on the CIA payroll allowing thousands of tons of cocaine to hit the streets of America via the Panama Canal. In episode four, George's son, the second George Bush, becomes partners with Osama bin Laden's older brother, Salem bin Laden, in a Texas oil company called Arbusto Energy. Episode five introduces George W.'s shady younger brother, Neil Bush, ripping off the elderly in the Silverado savings and loan scandal that cost U.S. taxpayers $1.3 billion. In episode six, the Florida election is fixed by George W.'s older brother, Jeb Bush, who puts brother George into the top job at the White House, which brings us back to Auschwitz and the concluding episode with George W. Bush visiting the slave labor camp where his grandfather helped build the Bush family fortune on free Jewish slave labor. These sites are a sobering reminder that of the power of evil and the need for people to resist evil. Ladies and gentlemen, as a follow-up to the TV series, an award show could celebrate the 20-year friendship of the Bush and Bin Laden families and their shared investment in the Carlyle Group. The Carlyle Group is one of America's largest weapons contractors. For the Bush and Bin Laden families, war means profits, big profits. Although the media creates the illusion of freedom of the press, the dominant opinion and messages always serve the bankster's agenda. Messages like, support your troops or you're a traitor to America. But who are the troops? Many are teenagers whose childhood entertainment was shooting out the blood and guts of virtual people in places that are virtually real. Now they're blowing up real people in places that are really real, like schools, hospitals, and villages filled with families and children. Burns, open wounds, amputations, spinal cord injuries, broken bones, eyes that have been sprayed with shrapnel.